Okay, so today in the UK, one million of us will go and visit our GP. That's about one in 66 people. Imagine if we could just harness even some of those contacts in the service of prevention. Such interventions, of course, would need to be opportunistic. Nobody goes to the doctor primarily to seek help with uh, behaviour change. Um, and we have national policies to support implementation of these policies that are in guidelines across all of the major uh, behavioural drivers of, of ill health. Uh, it's called making every contact count. But the trouble with that policy and the trouble with, for us is that such interventions, such brief opportunistic behavioural interventions vary from either uncommon to rare in practice. Uh, how might we change that? Well, the problem for uh, clinicians starts when they start to follow the guidelines. In the UK, we have guidelines called the three A's, ask, uh, advise, act. And in the US, they have two more A's than us, five A's, ask, <laughs> advise, and so on. <laughs> now, the trouble with the, doing this is that as soon as you start asking about smoking, for example, you run into bother. I'm going to replay. We've listened to hundreds of consultations of these brief interventions on recordings, either from a trial we did on brief interventions for obesity or on uh, doctors giving brief interventions in relation to smoking cessation uh, in response to a pay for policy performance uh, scheme. Uh, so the doctor will ask typically, So, do you smoke? The patient replies, uh, Not really. <laughs> But you do smoke. Well, I don't smoke smoke. <laughs> so how much do you smoke? Oh, not much. And so it goes on. These consultation patterns you see time and time again. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's sort of responsible for the, the problem that GPs say when they are asked in, in uh, qualitative studies. Why don't you do what the guidelines say? It's because when it comes down to it, they don't really like it. It's this sort of moral impasse that occurs because uh, of the moral valence of smoking and, uh, say, of being overweight in the context, in particular in the context in a consultation, but in broader context too. So how can we uh, break this impasse? Well, uh, we can disarm the moral conflict if we, instead of following the guidelines, we open our conversation with a brief offer of help. We systematically reviewed 13 trials of uh, brief interventions on smoking cessation, uh, and the, most of those focused on advice to quit on medical grounds. Uh, but a few of them also incorporated offers of help to quit. And what we found was that in head-to-head -head trials where those two things were compared, Offers of help to quit increased people's uh, initiation of behaviour change, in this case making a quit attempt, twofold compared to simply advising a person to quit because of the medical risks that they were running. The most direct test of this sort of gambit of offering help as the opening salvo uh, came in a trial that we did um, where we uh, randomised, we trained GPs to say, did you know the best way to lose weight is to go to uh, a weight loss program like Weight Watchers or Slimming World? It's local, it's free, and it's available on the NHS, and I can refer you now if you're willing to give that a go. And we looked at the effect that had on people. Still with Martin. There we go. Am I going the wrong way? I am. <laughs> I had it upside down. There we go. So this is the trial, and as you can see, we follow people up 12 months later. It somewhat increased the likelihood of them taking some kind of action, that, that, that uh, brief intervention. It increased fivefold the number of people that took effective action, and it doubled the chances of successful weight loss 12 months later. So. One feature that we incorporated into this trial is, a, I think, an underappreciated behavioural technique, and that is simply acting in the moment to arrange support. Um, take this randomised trial. This effectively randomised people to two identical interventions. In the left-hand case, uh, the proactive, uh, proactive telephone counselling, the only difference here was that p participants were offered the opportunity to ring a telephone quit line. These were people who wanted to, somewhat ambivalently, wanted to stop smoking. 
uh, they were offered the opportunity to ring a quit line and uh, uh, so the right hand case sorry were offered the opportunity nine percent of them made any contact at all and not percent of them completed a, set, a, a course of five sessions where they were left to call in to receive that support in the left hand case the proactive counseling the quit line called out to people 74%, that's nine times as many, met, had an initial counselling session and a quarter finished that counselling session. And most crucially of all, the rate of abstinence was fourfold higher in the group that had arranged support. Clinicians, you often feel, we all naturally feel in a way, that if a person's not motivated enough to bother to pick up the phone to engage in treatment, then they are not motivated enough to achieve anything by it. But the lesson of behavioural science is the reverse of that. Um, uh, we will and we can achieve good things, providing somebody else arranges for us to do so. The common element of uh, brief interventions for smoking and weight control is that referring to regular structured behavioural support is a key to achieving good outcomes. But what is it about that support that makes a difference? Well, there are probably lots of features, but I want to talk to you about one feature that I think is really important, which is the simplicity of the behavioural rule that is asked of people. Uh, we've shown in several randomised trials that training practice nurses to give weight loss support is less effective than referring people to these commercial weight loss programs like Weight Watchers and Slimming World. And that's very odd, isn't it? Because nurses should naturally have higher skills and better training than the lay people who run these uh, commercial programs, but they do worse. I think one of the explanations could well be because the rules uh, that these pro the commercial programs offer to help people change their dietary composition and reduce their portion size are simpler and easier to convey. Think Weight Watchers points, for example. Support for this comes from a recent systematic review we just completed looking at meal replacement programs where um, these programs um, uh, give people food themselves and they were compared with similar intensity behavioural support programs where people were left to choose the food by themselves. And what we showed is across a range of different intensities of support, the meal replacements were more effective. It fits with our other research that we and others have done on total diet replacement programs, where uh, the, uh, the, they far outperform any other form of weight loss. And of course, what their feature of those is, is that the rule is simplified to the maximum. The rule is simply this, eat what we've given you, don't eat anything else. It's the simplicity that might lead to higher adherence. Um, what we all want to believe is that what these behavioural programmes are doing is teaching people, providing skills and resources for them to achieve long-term sustainable changes to their diet. But the evidence is the contrary. There are a few people who make those regardless of the type of programme they follow. But most people will put on weight again. That doesn't negate the health benefits of the temporary weight reduction. But uh, it does tell us that these clear, simple rules are key to achieving good outcomes. So, to summarise, I think what we need to remember when we're dealing with these uh, behaviours is that they are not morally neutral, and the degree to which moral valence plays into it is a rather critical factor. Uh, we need to, uh, if we can, across a, probably a range of types of intervention, offering help as a sort of the, having a population that's offered help regularly is likely to be key to getting better outcomes. If we can act now and if we can arrange support for people that doesn't rely on their own agency to achieve that support, so much the better. And if we can get them into that support, then simplified rules will make it easier for people to adhere and achieve better outcomes. Thank you very much for listening.